The booming economy of the 1980s created a new class of investors. Car icon grew up poor in Bayside, Queens. But through brute force and intimidation, he became the most feared man in corporate America. Carl Icahn's childhood couldn't be more normal. He had loving but strict Jewish parents. They lived in a modest house in Bayside, Queens. But his parents were content, taking pride for being among the working people. But from an early age, Carl Icahn craved for something more, something better. And he knows it isn't going to be handed to him. He was a smart boy, but he was a total loner, spending all day just reading books. With work ethic, Carl Icahn becomes the top student of his class and is offered a scholarship for an elite private high school. This is a chance for a brighter future. But to Icahn's great disappointment, his parents turn it down. Carl Icahn's parents worried that private school might make Icahn a spoiled brat, losing touch with reality. And of course, he had to listen to his parents by going to a public school. For the first time, Karakum feels not being in control over his destiny. It was a pretty tough high school. It's closed now. And I grew up in uh, Bayswater, which is far Rockaway, yeah. and uh, it was a pretty na tough neighborhood. But Icahn continues to dream big. He stays quiet, studying even harder, because his dream is the Ivy League. His ambition is quickly shut down by his teachers, who remind him that no one has ever gotten into the Ivy League from his high school. Today, if you listen to Car Icon, he talks with that mobster accent. That is because he had to survive his high school and he had to become street smart, which is so important for his future success. His determination pays off. Icon was accepted by Princeton University the first ever in the history of his school. Although extremely proud of their son, Icon's parents couldn't afford to pay for the expenses. My father said, you know, son, I'm thinking about you. If you insist on going to Princeton, we decided we'll pay the tuition. I said, great, thanks, Dad, I really appreciate it, but not the room and board. So I said, well, wait a minute, how do I live? How do I eat? He said, you're a smart kid. I've watched you. You'll figure it out. Icon did figure out a way to make money. It is by playing poker. Every week I'd win, I don't know, four or five hundred bucks, three hundred bucks. I, every, at the end of the summer, I had two grand, two thousand. And that's when Ruben Board was only seven fifty. At Princeton, the socially isolated car icon is again out of his element. He devotes his entire day to studying philosophy and his night to playing poker and chess, eventually becoming the best player on campus. What we want to get across is the senior thesis represents one of the greatest opportunities a man has in this place. If we could show a visitor some of the titles, he'd see what we mean. His efforts were not in vain. His graduate paper won the best senior thesis of the year. The most important thing Karakon learned is to rely on his own reasoning process. He thinks independently before listening to other people. I think that's a common characteristic for many great investors. We don't often take the time to step back and ask why. Do we have good reasons? Philosophy invites us to do that kind of stepping back. It involves the critical scrutiny of our fundamental beliefs and convictions about the nature of reality, about knowledge, and about value. But Icon finds himself stuck at job hunting. He joined the Army Reserves and also became a cashier at Macy's. 25 and 3 quarters for 100 CMS. So, With the help of his wealthy uncle, Icon became a stockbroker. Riding the bolt market of the early 60s, Icon's career takes off. When I got into Wall Street, I had 12, 15,000, which was a lot saved, you know? I started investing it, and I'm buying all these stocks, I'm picking this and I'm picking that, and I had a following of people who would listen to me, oh wow, well, you can... but everybody was making money.
I went out, I remember once and bought a Galaxy convertible then, it was a beautiful car. I had a beautiful girlfriend. It was a model, it was just pretty nice. Like his usual self, he spends all of his spare time reading books and learning about the stock market. Then the market teaches him a lesson that he will never forget. What happened, the crash came in 1962. I was wiped out in one day. I didn't even have the poker winnings left. That was a day after what was called the flash crash. That's a day in which the Dow lost 5.8%, and at that point in time, this was the biggest point loss that they had seen since the Great Depression. This, of course, was before people had a Bloomberg terminal or the internet or TV stations that would give you instant access to stock prices. Only ticker tapes could do that, and there was so much volume on that day that it actually took the tapes hours after the close that day to print all the trade. People didn't know for probably three hours after the close how much money they'd actually lost on that day, so you can imagine and what they were feeling. You had to go through the pain. You have to go through it. The market is not a gambling casino, and too many people in this type of market, too many people think it is. To get back in the game, he needs to find his edge, and it will come from an unlikely place. The late 1950s saw a booming economy like no other, but underneath the prosperity, a crisis was brewing, and America was going to be forever disrupted. Determined to become rich, Icon joined the Wall Street. But when the bubble burst, he lost all of his money. But Carl Icon is a relentless man. He knows there's a weight back in the game. And in short order, he finds a niche market about to explode. I had a few bucks left, very little, and I said I gotta learn something. So I read a lot about puts and calls, and in those days, that was really the Wild West, the puts and calls. Icon realized the options market has the potential to revolutionize the finance industry and make him rich in the process. Uh, when you buy insurance on your house, it's like buying a put option on your house, although it may be not directly connected to the home's value, but right? When you buy an insurance policy on your house and the house burns down, you collect on the insurance policy. Uh, well, the price of your house fell to zero. If you had bought a put option on the house, it would do the same thing, right? You, you would have an uh, option to sell it at a high price, uh, something that's now worthless. He finds a job as an option broker for an unknown company called Gruntle. Just like cryptocurrency today, options market were full of scams and price manipulations. Always doing things differently, Icon decides he will become the first honest broker putting his client's interests first and delivering more on what he promises. And you had all these option brokers, if you remember, and they were fleecing everybody. So I was the honest broker, so to speak. I'd come in and tell everybody, so put out a midweek option report, and I'd stay up every night calling people that write in for my report, and I'd be calling them from Cal to California. And I had a big following in options, and I'd give them more than they thought they would get, which I couldn't believe. Here's a guy that I don't know from New York, calling these, this wealthy guy, and he'll sell, sell 10 calls on this stock, and I'll do it for five grand. I get him six grand, the guy couldn't believe it. Icon has struck gold. In a few years, Carl Icon builds the options business into the most profitable department at Gruntle. After accumulating a list of wealthy clients, Icon decides to start his own brokerage firm. We built up a big following in the 68 bought the seat on the stock exchange with the help of uh, one of my uncles and uh, by that time, I saved a pretty big amount of money for those days. In the late 1960s, while the country was in turmoil, Carl Icahn's career has arrived at a new height. While average middle class like his parents make barely $10,000 a year, his personal income has inflated to $350,000 a year. I, I was once the rich uncle, now he's the rich nephew. And also inflated is his lifestyle. He started spending his weekends at Hamptons, going on dates with fashion models. Money is no longer an object for him. But Carl Icahn is actually driven more by power and control. First, he took control of his own life. Now he's thinking, what else is there for me to control? His brokerage business has created a consistent stream of income. Carl Icahn now wants to invest his profits. And then I got into arbitrage. You, you could buy different convertible bonds and short the stocks against them. You had no risk, but you could make a lot of money. And eventually we did real well with that. In the few short years, arbitrage became his most profitable department. But then Icon ponders the question, 
If it could do arbitrage like that with convertible bonds, can he do the same to corporations that are undervalued? In their pursuit of profits, the pioneers like Rockefeller and Carnegie were among the first to embrace modern corporations, in which shareholders and the management worked together for a common goal. But by the 1960s, Carl Icahn has observed that it is no longer the case for many companies. But basically, you look for the reason that they're, they're, they're really cheap, and the major reason is often and usually uh, very poor management. So in a sense, it's a, like an arbitrage. You go in, you buy a lot of stock in the company, and you uh, then try to make changes at the company. Once it takes control of the company, he can replace the management to unlock more value. A simple proposition, yet extremely difficult to execute. Icon's first target was a small appliance company, Tapan. Carl Icahn discovered that its book value was twice as much as its market price. If he could find a buyer for the company close to the book value, then he's set to double his money. Remember, Icon was a savvy chess and poker player. He thinks many, many steps ahead of everybody else. He thinks about different possibilities and different outcomes and how to deal with them. Carl Icahn begins accumulating shares of Tapan. Then he makes a phone call to the president of the company. Icahn, of course, had done a lot of homework. But during that phone call, he pretended to be very naive. And the president of the company was thinking that he was some dumb rich kid. All of this allowed Icahn to quietly build out $3 million controlling positions without showing his true intentions. By now, Icon has acquired enough shares to be the biggest shareholder for the company. And all of a sudden, Icon informs the management that he would like for the company to be acquired. But he would also like to keep being a passive investor. What the hell does that mean? This is a classic car icon. He never shows his true intentions. His intent is to create frustration that his opponent makes mistakes. But secretly, Icon is working hard to buy more shares and to find a company that will acquire Tapan. Once the management realized that Icon's intention was hostile, they decided to create a poison pill by trying to dilute Icon's shares. So a poison pill is a contract between the company and its transfer agent that if it's triggered, imposes massive economic dilution on the bad actor, the person who's trying to acquire the company or increasing their position in a way that the board doesn't find acceptable. That was a mistake. Using poison pill allows Icon the perfect excuse to convince other shareholders that a management is incompetent and only looks out for itself. Since the shareholders meeting is coming up, he rallies the shareholders to vote for him to become a board member. Once Carl Icahn became a board member, he threatens to fire all other board members unless they do exactly what he says. At this point, Icahn has created such a terror that all the board members were looking out for themselves. With that, the board found a buyer. Another appliance company agrees to acquire Tapan for $18 a share. This means in less than a year, Carl makes $2.7 million profit in this first takeover. This victory made Icahn realize that there's so much hidden value in America's capitalist system. They're hidden because there are not enough people with guts to take on the establishment. Carl Icahn, a man with Ivy League education and street smart, is more capable than anyone to take on corporate America. And his timing couldn't be more perfect. The 80s became the golden decade for takeover artists. The highest order of business before the nation is to restore our economic prosperity. Companies are highly leveraged with virtually unlimited cash. Whenever they're threatened, the company would just pay off raiders by offering them green mails. So I come outside with him and said, look, he said, they don't like you at all. If you start buying more stock, we're going to dilute the hell out of you. He said, now on the other side of the coin, We'll give you, you don't have the stock too long, we'll give you a $10 million profit to walk away. 
he looks at me and says, do you want some time to think about it? I said, no, I'll take the 10 million. <laughs> as car icon targets more companies, he amasses unprecedented fortunes. Regular family, they, the husband works and there's always something, at least financially, to look forward. They're building, they're I mean, here it's not, uh, I mean, how much more if he makes, it's not going to make any difference. But even the smartest people make mistakes, and Carl Icahn is about to face his biggest challenge yet. TWA presents the difference between getting you where you're going and leading the way. With immense competition and unionization, airlines have become unable to make profits. It, it's been a disaster for capital. I mean, it, it's got glamour to it, so you can, all, you can always get guys to put some money up for an airline. Car Icon is about to be that guy. He believes TWA was undervalued because it has strong cash flows. If he takes control of the airline, he can find ways to cut costs, making it profitable, which will increase its share price. Icon begins buying TWA stock for $9.5 per share, less than a company's book value. In just a few months' time, Icon acquired 20% of TWA's equity. Like his usual move, Icon appears to be innocent and harmless, promising that he's looking out for the long term of the company. At this point, Icon has already built a reputation for being a ruthless raider. The management immediately strikes back. TWA was a major airline at the time, therefore it had the ability to influence politics. The first counterattack from TWA is to convince the government to block Icon from exercising his shares. But in a surprise turn of events, the legislators have grown tired of TWA's underperformance. They decide not to block Car Icon from seeking control of the company. But the TWA's management is just as relentless. They quickly initiate their second counterattack, which is finding a white knight, a friendlier buyer. After a few candidates, they found a Texas ear, which is surprisingly is run by another corporate raider who also grew up from Queens, Frank Lorenzo. They offered a near $22 per share to acquire TWA. Icon bought the company at about $10 a share. He could exit now and make 100% return. But this isn't about money anymore. This is about winning. This is about control. Always the strategist, Icon knows that his enemy's enemy is going to be his friend. Icon managed to get something TWA's management could not get, labor concessions. The unions, pilots and machinists agreed to approximately 20% in salary cuts in exchange for a small piece of the company if Icon took over. They wanted Icon to come in because TWA had announced a merger with Texas Air President Frank Lorenzo. Lorenzo was known for being tough on unions. With the support of unions, Icon defeats Lorenzo and successfully takes over TWA. I, who know nothing about management, could do what I did at ACF. And again, I'm not, I'm not employing myself, I'm saying it's a sad commentary. It really, and I'm, I'm telling you that I'm not that great at management. Icon is about to violate his own role. He becomes the managing chairman of TWA. Icon fantasizes about becoming a titan like Rockefeller or Howard Hughes, and he let that get inside his head. Icon begins to cut salaries, shutting down infrequent flies, a year later, TWA achieved an improvement in profits. We took TWA from losing, and today we're making, we just have record earnings of 300 million. But it came at a hidden cost. Icon has cut the salaries of flight attendants, and anger starts to build up. I don't think he has TWA in his best interests, nor has he ever had TWA in his best interests. But for now, the business seems to be thriving, and that is good enough for Icon to exit. With the cash flow the company has now generated, Icon takes the company private. What it means is that he used the company's money to buy back all the public shares. It also means that he just paid himself a lot of money. Carl Icahn, if he could live on $105 a week. 
Before long, the company's in trouble again. This time, everyone is against Car Icon. He's then ousted as a chairman. In spite of that, Icon still made many times over his original investment. But TWA continued to struggle and filed for bankruptcy in 1997. The 80s booming economy created a special class of investors, the takeover artists. Car Icon is the undisputed king of takeovers. Through his countless battles against corporations, Car Icon became the most feared raider in America. After raking hundreds of millions from TWA, he has built a fearsome personal brand. The mention of his name can create shocks to the stock market. But time has changed. Corporate raiding has now become widely accepted as shareholder activism. Well, I think the main thing that has been happening now is uh, you have this uh, bloom of hedge fund activism. And a lot of that has been driven by, you know, the complicit uh, uh, passive investors be uh, behind the scenes, the big institutions. And all of a sudden people realize that what ICON has been doing could be beneficial to corporate America. After the housing crisis of 2008, ICON went on a buying spree. He purchased Netflix in 2003 and managed to get eBay to spin up PayPal at that same year. But then he set his aim at a bigger target. He was going to take on Tim Cook. Is it possible that Apple was undervalued because of Tim Cook? I met Tim Cook because at that time, there were guys calling me and saying, hey, we got to get rid of this Tim Cook. Right. And I met him and I said, this guy's great. Impressed by Tim Cook, Icon started heavily investing in Apple. By the time he exited his positions in 2016, Icon made $2 billion on his Apple investment. Making money has become too easy for Car Icon. With his reputation, he can raise the stock price just by pretending to take over a company. But Icon enjoys winning more than anything else. Sometimes he looks for a good fight and he's about to face his toughest opponent.